Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. One of the quotes that I love is from a guy named Thomas Carlyle. He said this, Our grand business, undoubtedly, is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. So that's what I think is important for us to recognize today. It's not how do I get there and reach that goal that's far away. It's how do I take a step that is clearly in front of me today to take. And so I'm praying for you that God will help you to do that. Now, John 6 Verse 29, Jesus says this. He says that the work of God is to believe, to believe in the one that he sent. And I love thinking about that because that's a very, that's a, that's a step. That's an immediate step because his disciples are asking Jesus. They're saying, hey, what is it? Tell us about what it means to, to do the work of the kingdom of God. And, you know, they've got these grand visions in mind. And Jesus says, hey, here's the work for you, and that is that you believe. And that you trust. Everything else follows from that. And that's what John says that his gospel is being. When we talk about signs of life, we're talking about the, the we're, we're walking through these seven signs that John gives to us, us in his gospel by which we should believe in Jesus. Because of which and through which we can trust Jesus with our lives. So that's what we're talking about. Would you stand today? And I'm going to read our text. I know I've been giving you a little bit of talk here. And, and it, we're going to need to bring these monitors down. They're just crackling on me here, so we'll just, we'll just work without them today. Our text comes from John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And here's the story. It says, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. And one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. That is the third sign that John gives to us in his gospel. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that in this moment together, you're able to see where every single person is at. God, you know our, our coming and our going. You know our yesterday and our today and our tomorrow. And so, Lord, today I pray that you would speak from your word to each person. That's more than I can do with a microphone in my hand. But I believe, God, you can do it today as you would speak to every heart and meet each one of us where we are today. So let this word fall like a seed on good soil in our hearts and let it produce fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated again. You know, my goal when I get up here is to help us see the Scriptures and understand how they can apply to our lives and and really begin to kind of implement them in some way. And so let me give you three thoughts from our text today as we're walking through each one of these signs as we approach Easter Sunday, which, by the way, is going to be popping and fun. Um, It's going to be great. Um, As we approach that, we're going to be walking through each one of these things, and I'm going to be wanting to give you some thoughts. And so uh, just to get right into it today, when when I am praying about this and when we look at this text, there's something that jumped out as I began preparing weeks ago for this that has been... I feel like is an important word for you guys today. And so not to say that points two and three don't matter, but point one is the one that I've been chewing on now for weeks, and I want to give it to you. And this this is the first thought. And I do encourage you to maybe make some notes. I won't, I won't have a problem if you got your phone out and because nobody, you know, when you show paper and pen to kids today, they're like, what is that? Um, Everybody is taking notes on their phone, so I'm not going to have a problem if you do that, but I do like for you to take notes 
because then when you go back to this, it actually, um, it actually can be a blessing again in your life. So here's the first thing if you're, if you're keeping score today. Get your mind right for the miracle. Get your mind right for the miracle. Now, memory is selective and interpretive. What I mean is I remember as I choose the things that I choose to remember, and I interpret those things through a particular lens of my beliefs about myself, about my world, everything else. There, I'm always interpreting those memories, and so that's important. I li- Let me just give it like this. I like to think that when I was younger, I was a decent athlete, okay? That was, a, that was a, a part of who I was as a younger person, but it's amazing. As I get older, the older that I get, the better an athlete I was. It's selective and interpretive. Like, I don't think, I just think, man, I, I think I was a great athlete, a really great athlete. And the older that I get, the, it's almost like the fonder those memories become. And, and the more detached from reality I actually become. Parents of children are always throwing out very specific. If you talk to any of these families that dedicated their kids today, my guess is they're going to throw out some very specific. How old is your, how old is your daughter? And they're going to throw out a very specific number. Like, you know, oh, they're 17 weeks, you know. And, or, you know, even, even when they get a little bit older, parents are still in the habit of doing this. They're, they're 37 months. And... <laughs> I can remember, I mean, we do that too, so there's no, no shade on anybody who's doing that. But what I'm saying is um, when I was a single person and I would talk to parents like that, I would get annoyed by it because I'd be like, why are you making me do math just for this simple question? Just say, oh, she's almost two, you know, or something like that. But this is the thing. When it matters to us, we keep track. When it's really important to us, we keep track. And John tells us in our text that this man has been lame for 38 years. And that's a very specific number. You would think that once you get above a certain, you know, couple of decades or whatever, you would just start talking in decades or maybe most of his life. But 38 years is such a specific number, it's almost as if he's been keeping track. He's been by the pool of Bethesda. So close, but never getting in. He tells Jesus he has to watch everybody else every day that that goes by. He's watching other people get into the pool before him. And that sort of discouragement can make a person feel like they're cursed. Right? That sort of day after day discouragement impacts a person experiences like that form patterns and grooves in our mind, right? A fixed way of seeing ourselves and the people around us. 38 years is a long time. Think about that. If all you've ever known for that amount of time is lameness, it's possible that you could lose any appetite for wholeness. It's possible that you could lose any hope for wholeness. If all you've ever known is dysfunction in relationship, you grew up in a dysfunctional home with with a uh, with a you know parents either that 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 had a you know a, a rocky marriage or whatever, you might end up choosing dysfunction in your relationships in your adult life. You might pick a guy who mistreats you because that's your normal. The nice guys seem boring to you. Let me tell you. If you've ever said that, that's a problem, right? The ones who treat, he just treats me nice. I don't know. It just kind of makes me feel nice. That just says that there might be something off in terms of your expectation. If all you've ever known is debt, then you might find yourself making more money but having more debt over your head. That's not the problem of, 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 what, what, you know, of how much money you're making. That's the problem of what's become normal to you, the patterns that you've established in your life. If all you've ever known is anger or grudges, then forgiveness and kindness might not even seem like options on the table to you. This man has 38 years of a pattern that's been established in his mind, and nothing is going to change until he develops the nimbleness of mind to think differently 
all right? Have you today developed the mental dexterity that is required to step into God's work, what he wants to do in your life, and he wants what he wants to do through your life? Do you have the mental dexterity for it? You see, everything that you see today began as a thought. The building that we're in was conceived in the mind of an architect, right? The phone that's in your hand or in your pocket right now, that you're always keeping track of it no matter where it is, though. You know where that is. That phone began as the thought. And, I, you know, maybe we could give credit to Steve Jobs for that, but there were probably a whole bunch of other people that he took the credit from. But here's the thing. It began as a thought in somebody's mind. Buildings, cars, phones, whatever it is, they all, out of the abundance of somebody's thoughts, came those things. And out of the abundance, the Bible says, of God's thoughts came the world as we know it. By the wisdom of God, Colossians says, everything that is made was made. Now, some people scoff at that idea today. Are you trying to tell me, Steve, that God ordered the world? Well, let's get with the times. Science tells us a much more you know, scientific story, an explanation that billions of years ago there was a primordial atom that, you know, it was a ball of all the potential mass and energy ever to be in the universe, and it existed floating in the nothingness and then spontaneously exploded, and everything that we see formed from that. That's science. And to me, it seems not that I would disbelieve that, but the idea somehow that that negates that Every, all of the order that I see in the universe came from the ordered mind of God doesn't make any sense. This is, this is what the psalmist said. He said, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. Here's what I want you to see. Out of the abundance, out of the, God's word, God's thoughts are pregnant with possibilities. And out of the abundance of his thoughts, the psalmist said, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. I want to know what you think, O God. And here's what I'm driving at today. That, that, that some of the dysfunctional thinking in our mind, it will only be corrected when we begin to bring our mind under the word of God. When we begin our, to take our thinking under the thoughts of God. That's what has to happen for you today. If I get insight into the mystery of God's wisdom, if I, can, if I can see God's thoughts when I look at his word, then I am only hurting myself when I remain ignorant to it. When I, when I am not willing to submit my thinking to the thoughts of God. There, there is an epidemic of anxiety in our world today. And for the very first time in my lifetime, I feel like I could speak with some certainty about what's happening, make, making blanket statements about our world. It's a really crazy time right now that we could say that there is an epidemic of disquietude, of anxiety in our world today. And I take that seriously. I'm not being dismissive of it. I would say this. It was trending that way already, but pandemic and everything else that's happened in the past few years and that's happening today right now kind of has dialed all that up. It magnified it. And thank goodness, within the church even, we have shed the stigma of conversations about mental health and the importance of that. I, I think that's wonderful. And I would say this, I, I have referred so many people to counselors over the years as a, as a youth pastor. I have, I've, I've treasured, I've, I've literally, you know, written thank you notes to counselors to say thank you for your ministry to, to these young people or to this, these people that I referred to you to. It, it, we've shed the stigma about that. But I want to say this, as good as that is, and as much as I believe it, let me also give you a referral to the Word of God. Let me also refer you to what, what, what God says about you and about the world that you live in. Because if you lack that, then you are lacking the most important peace that you can have in your framework of how to see the world. You can be a great leader, and you can lay awake anxious at night and afraid. You can, you can be a great preacher. And, and, the, and the enemy will fight you in your thoughts. You can be a young person with beauty and potential or an older person with wisdom and experience. And if the enemy can defeat you in your thoughts, he has already succeeded in snuffing out God's miracle in your life. 
So you need to get your mind right. Proverbs 23 says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The way that you talk to yourself, the way that you think about yourself is going to shape how you behave and how you act. It's going to actually make a difference in the way that you live and what happens in your life. Think about that woman that the gospel writers tell us had an issue of blood for 12 years. She was sick. She'd seen every kind of doctor. It had only gotten worse over time. And then as Jesus comes through town that day, she, the Bible says this. It says, she thought to herself. I actually think some translations say, she said to herself, I will go and touch the hem of his garment. What she didn't do, she did not refer to a theology about hem, you know, garment hem touching, right? She had no, but there was something about her thinking that she was willing to speak to herself and say, you know what, I will take a step. I will move out in faith and trust that actually was the key to that miracle. If she hadn't said it to herself, it never would have happened. Jesus sees this man who's been lame for 38 years, and he asks him what seems like a cruel question. He says, would you like to be well? Uh, yeah. (laughs) But Jesus is wise enough to know. The reason he asks the question is because this man's problems now go deeper than legs that aren't working the right way. Now, His whole sense of self is wrapped up in this. For 38 years, the story that he has allowed to dictate his life has been that he is cursed. He is less than. He's not good enough. He has been rejected and considered unworthy. So before Jesus can ever restore his body, Jesus is speaking to his mind and to his spirit. Do you want to be well? People organize whole identities around past wounds, around the story that has been told to them, maybe the ongoing narrative in their lives of who they are, that they are less than, they are not enough, they're not good enough. They or- organize their whole sense of self around that. And so they have these, these things that have defined them, and, and in their present, now it's determining everything that's going on, and in their future, it's going to determine that. And I want to say this to you today. I know that your past is real. I'm not denying that. I'm not denying any of the things that have happened to you. I'm not dismissing any of the challenges or the wounds that you've taken. I know that that is real. But I want you to know this, even though you should remember those things and reckon with those things, when you are in Christ, every other voice in your life, every other experience in your life, now every other influence in your life has to take a knee in the presence of Jesus. That's what has to happen. You have to begin to believe. When you are in Christ, there is something now that is greater that is defining you. So who gets to define the truth about you? Is it that person who left you? Is it that person who said that stuff about you? Is it, is it, is it what they did to you? Is it, is it what happened? Let me, let me ask you, who is defining it? Is it all of those things or is it the person that the Bible says is the author and the finisher of our faith? I, I just say this, author and finisher pretty much covers it all. Right? Are you letting him write your story or someone else? God is not finished with you. That's why you're here today. Jesus is challenging this man to believe. After 38 years of incapacity, he says, do do you believe that this lameness no longer defines you when when the author of life is addressing you? So that's the first point. It's the longest point. Get your mind right for the miracle. Secondly, get your eyes off of other people. Our our middle child, Aria, she, um, every night when she goes to to bed now, you know, there's a routine at that age. She's she's, uh, 25 months. I'm just kidding. (laughs) She's about to turn three, so actually she's at 35 months. But anyway, um, so I have to scratch her back, right? She just likes her back to be scratched. So I'll scratch her back, and then she'll do this thing where she's laying there, and I think that she's done, and I'll stop, and I'll say, good night, Ari, and, she go, and she'll look up at me. She'll go, it's not enough. 
And then I'll, I'll rub her back a little bit longer because I want to avoid any of the, you know, you're just trying to. And then she'll finally say, that's enough. <laughs> so the other night is about, I think, maybe 3.30 or 4 a.m., and I had this, this happens, I tell you guys these stories all the time. I'm just giving you regular updates on the things my kids wake, up, wake me up to say to me. And, and I'm laying in bed and all of a sudden I feel that feeling of, that eerie feeling of somebody is staring at me. And it's dark in the room and my kid's hair is long and it looks like the girl from the ring, right? And she's standing there. <laughs> and she, I look over and she's looking at me and then she just said, it's 3.30 in the morning. It's not enough. It was terrifying. I mean, it took me a minute to get my bearings and stuff like that. So I had to go back and scratch her back so she'd go back to sleep. So the average person, I'm told, spends two hours a day on social media. This stat came from prior to pandemic, so I imagine that it's even more now. That's 600 hours per year, 25 days every year spent on social media. Study after study has confirmed an increase in anxiety and depression that correlates with social media use. Am I trying to say that social media is evil? Yes. Or no, but it creates, this is what it does do, it creates a platform for comparison, right? And comparison puts our eyes in the wrong place. This is what this guy says to Jesus. He says, listen, Jesus asks him about him, and he starts talking about everybody else. The man at the pool saw everybody else competing with him for a miracle, and it's how many of us are spending our time every day, day and night, scrolling and hearing this voice in our head saying, it's not enough, you're not enough. Your career, your accomplishments, your family, they're more beautiful than your family. Your marriage, oh, they have such a great marriage. What's wrong with yours? It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not like what I imagined. It's not enough. Let me give you a couple of quick definitions here. There's something I want to talk about, scarcity mentality. Scarcity says I'm competing for a limited amount of resources it's basically the fundamental principle driving our world, <laughs> right? Then I want to give you another idea or thought right here, abundance mentality. Abundance mentality says this, I'm living in the faithful provision of God in every situation. I can always tell one of the surest signs of somebody who has encountered the living God is that they experience a shift in their lives from a scarcity mentality to an abundance mentality. No longer do they spend their time saying, it's not enough, it's not enough. What they spend their time thinking, when you have encountered the living God, you start saying, he is enough, he is enough, he is enough. Not it's not enough, he is enough. We say generosity is our privilege here. You hear that line thrown up all the time. But the reason that we say that is because we are living with an abundance mentality. We get the joy of being a vessel for God's provision in somebody else's life. Channels through which God can bless others. We get to see God's generous hand and provision over and over again. The man is talking about everybody else. And Jesus says, look at me, buddy. Don't worry. Get your eyes off of them. That's that scarcity mentality. I'm here. I have enough to meet your need today. I have enough to give you what you need. There is always an abundance with God. Psalm 3410 says, lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Now, I had this revelation not too long ago. When I was reading this, and it was almost as if God spoke to me. I, don't, I can't explain it, but there's just this thought just came to my head screaming at me that was like this. And it felt like he was saying this to me. Steve, if you don't have it, then it's not good for you right now. Because those who seek me lack no good thing. Right? Psalm 84 says, God will withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly. Okay? If you are lacking it in your life, let me, just, let me just help you with this. Then it isn't good for you right now. You say, oh, what about that promotion? <laughs> I really want that promotion. Maybe it's not good for you right now. Well, maybe you've been praying for, this. maybe you've been thinking, oh, I'm just looking for, a, looking for a, a, a wife. I just need, a, I need to get a wife, you know. I need to get a wife. And God might say, well, the reason you don't have a wife is not a good thing for you right now. That, mo- that wouldn't be good for, for her or for you. <laughs> 
He might be teaching you trust. He might be teaching you patience. He might not be teaching you anything at all. It just might be part of his plan for you to wait, okay? But here's, a, here's what you can bank on. If it is good for you, he will give it to you, all right? Get your eyes off of others. There's no need to worry about them. He is enough. And thirdly, get your feet ready to move. Jesus asked the man, do you want to be well? He was asking him, are you ready to get your feet moving? Are you ready to walk on the strength of your own two legs? Are you ready to leave this behind, what has become your identity day after day? Because even though it was disappointing for him day after day, it was also comfortable for him. It was what he knew. And so Jesus is saying, are you willing, are you ready to leave this behind? The people of Israel... They left Egypt, but if you know the story, after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, it had become rather comfortable for them. It was what they knew. You know, there's that phrase, people always say this, you know, the devil you know. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. There's so many phrases that people say where I don't know the second half of it, and so I really don't know what it means. The de- you know, the devil you know. So, you know, so they, they, they left Israel after 400 years of slavery, but it was, they weren't even gone just a few days before they started complaining and thinking about how great it was to be back in Egypt. Right? This, this is the thing. They're, they're kicking themselves that they didn't leave a forwarding address, right? They were free, but for a long time they hadn't stepped into the promises of God. And so they're kind of living between their prayer for freedom and the fulfillment of that promise. So Jesus tells the man, I can if you're willing. And that turns things upside down for me. Because most of us don't think of it like that. We're always praying like this. Oh, God, I hope you're willing. Please, I just hope you're willing. So maybe he's willing. Maybe he's willing to, maybe he's willing to bless me. Maybe he's willing. Let me... That's, that's the wrong approach. Because Jesus isn't asking the question. He says, hey, do you think I'm willing today, buddy? He says, oh, I'm willing and I can. The real question is, are you willing? That is the question. It's not Jesus' power to heal. It's this man's willingness to walk it out. You see... I'll just tell you this, and this can free some of you guys up. You can be free, but still be unfinished. You can be free, but still be unfinished. You can be in Christ, but you can have a lot of work that needs to be done. And the question is, not whether God can set you free from that addictive behavior, not whether or not God can actually get you to the place that you're supposed to go or guide your steps or direct you or bless you or do any of that stuff. It isn't really a question of his willingness or of his power. It's a question of your willingness to walk it out. And to trust him. If I can get my mind right, if I can get my eyes off of others, I can start the journey toward wholeness that God has me on. And some of you guys have wondered a word that we don't use a lot, but if you just want to help yourself a little bit, whenever the Bible talks about holiness, it's really helpful just to, to think maybe about wholeness a little bit. That this is what holiness is. It's not this detached sort of, oh, I'm too good for everybody else and, you know, I won't let that touch me. I can't be. That is, that Jesus was holy and he was never like that. Holiness is wholeness. <laughs> and when we talk about experiencing new life through Jesus here, when we talk about a new way of honoring God and a new purpose of helping other people to do the same, we're talking about a journey toward holiness, toward wholeness. And it's not just about me. It's not just about what is happening in my life. We, we, we say that the end part of that journey is a, a new purpose of helping others to do the same. And this is what I believe. If you want to understand, there are high stakes on your willingness today to walk out God's plan for your life. Because it isn't just about you. It isn't just about you. You see, my hope, my prayer, I am not willing to see my children tempted with the same things that I have wrestled with in my life. I don't want to see my children bear up the same character flaws that I've got. It is not just about me. I want God to work in me because I want them to be blessed in a new way. I refuse to pass on. Some of you need to say, I refuse today to pass on this anger problem, that, 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 that pattern of infidelity that I saw at work in my 
parent, in my grandparents' generation and in my parents' generation. I refuse to, to see my marriage go down that path. Some of you need to say that to yourself, to say, I am breaking this cycle today because it's not just about me. That's what we were praying for with all these precious families up here. When we say passing on a general blessing, let me just generational blessing, we're actually also talking about breaking some of those generational curses. Not just about you today, but that journey that God has you on toward wholeness is so much bigger than you. Some of you today, you need to see, you'll never have. I just felt this in my heart. You'll never have the wife that you want until you fight for the wife that you have. You'll never have the husband that you want until you're willing to fight for the husband that you have. you never have the marriage that you want until you're willing to fight for the marriage that you have now. To say, I refuse to go down that road. So my life is, is designed by God to to, to live free and to help others to live free. We pray like God's willingness is in question, but it's not. Our willingness is the question. Are you willing today? Are you willing to obey his command? Are you willing to listen to the word of God even when it means leaving your comfort? Have we made a God out of comfort? (laughs) Or are we willing to listen to what God is calling us to? Because I I see it in operation in our world today. I see it all the time. We couch it in other terms. We kind of make it about, you know, it's this this political issue or it's this, um, you know, it's this relational issue. It's this family problem that we've got. But really, we're just comfortable with the way things are. And God's people are called to be different. Are you willing? Because he was willing, we can be free. And when I talk about willing, Jesus said it plainly. He said, he, 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 let, his, he, he let his disciples know, he said, no man takes my life. Nobody can come over here and take my life. I mean, there was even a part where he said, if I wanted to, I could call down a legion of angels, wipe all y'all out. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. He was willing, the Bible says, to lay his life down so that you and I could be forgiven and free. I want you to, I want you to see today the power for you to walk free, to be free, isn't found in any other thing than the finished work of Jesus on the cross because he laid his life down and no other reason, no priest, no program, no church attendance, no, you, you, can, you go down the line, no reputation, no money, no degree, nothing is going to do it because if it could be achieved by any other way, then he wouldn't have laid his life down. There is no other way. Your work today, let me just say this, he did that work. He did all the work, and he said it's finished. Your work today is to believe. Your work today is to embrace that and to act upon it. Jesus' willingness to endure the cross, to scorn its shame, was all so that we could be welcomed into relationship with the Heavenly Father, that our sins could be forgiven and that we could be free. I'm going to invite everyone to bow your head for just a moment today. And at at the end of our services here, every week, give an opportunity for people to respond just in a simple way, through a simple prayer, to respond to what God has done, the work that Jesus has done. And to simply say, I believe. We, we say to receive God's grace and forgiveness and the gift of a new life in Christ is as simple as A, B, C. Now the A is to admit that we need forgiveness from God. That there is something broken inside of us fundamentally that needs to be fixed. But the B part is to believe And to say, because of what Jesus did, because he lived the life that I should have lived, and he died the death that I deserved to die, I believe that 
I can receive that forgiveness. And the C is to confess. Confess with our mouths. Just like the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. That's what the Bible says. So with every head bowed for just one minute, I'm going to invite you in a second just to simply acknowledge and say, I I need to believe that today. I need forgiveness today, and I want that. There's no other work for you to do today than to simply believe it. And if that's you, where you are today, just right where you're seated right now, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand, and I'm going to pray for you before we go today. If that's you, just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's three hands. Or is, there, is there a fourth? Thank you. Praise God. We give you one more second. This is, Holy Spirit might be, might be stirring something in your heart today. You say, I need to believe. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down today, and we're going to pray together. We do this every week. As a matter of fact, I want you all to look at me right now because I'm not trying to make this mysterious or creepy or weird or anything else. This decision that these folks have made to say, I want to receive the, the grace of God is the greatest decision that you could make today. Amen? So, I'm going to invite you to pray along with me. And everybody will make this confession today. So you could close your eyes again if you want. Some of you, some of you are comfortable. You pray with your eyes on my mind. But here's the thing. Let's say this together. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you were the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you paid for it all. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be made new. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name we pray.